presentation is Functions Want to Be Free. Uh, my name is David Stone. Um, so let's get started. So one of the main goals in developing software is this idea of composability. The idea is that you can write code once and reuse it many times. You can build something big from many small things. It's a way to manage complexity, to minimize how many things you have to change when you're trying to conceptually just change one thing. Um, it leads you toward the goal of don't repeat yourself or dry. Now, in object-oriented programming, I think we should focus on the goal and not the syntax. The goal of object-oriented programming is to maximize encapsulation. The goal is not to write member functions. Now, historically, member functions and object-oriented syntax or object-oriented programming have often gone together, but you don't necessarily need that to achieve the goals. Um, and in fact, there's an article by Scott Myers, uh, Dr. Dobbs' article, titled "How Non-Member Functions Improve Encapsulation." So, in my presentation, I'm going to be go going over many of the ideas that he expresses there, and then maybe going a little bit farther. Um, Herb Sutter wrote an article, a Guru of the Week article, called Monoliths Unstrung. He looked at all 103 member functions, including overloads, that standard string has, and he made 71 of them free functions. Many of those functions duplicated the functionality in the algorithm header, for instance, find and copy. Now, standard basic string is generally agreed by most people to be a monolithic class. It's a class that has a whole bunch of stuff in its interface that maybe doesn't need to be there. Now, for my presentation, I'd like to do a similar exercise. But instead of going over standard basic string, I'm going to use a class that is most people's favorite class in the standard library, standard vector. Um, so we're going to implement most of standard vector right here and see exactly how much of standard vector's implementation details do we need to care about and how much can we use using just its public interface. We're going to take a top-down approach implement functions in terms of other functions, and everything left over can just be a normal function. So let's consider functions related to size. We have size. We can define that as just end minus begin. Empty is begin equals end. Now we could also implement this as size is not equal, or yeah, size equals zero. That'd be the more conventional approach. But I chose to implement it this way for a very particular reason, and we'll come back to that later. So we have size, empty, and we have max size. Now, most people probably have never used max size. Um, the general idea of what max size means is theoretically ignoring the limits of your particular system, the, the exact amount of memory you have available, what is the most amount of elements that this container could allocate using its allocator and using the, uh, the address space available. Um, shrink to fit was a function added in C++11. Now, one way that we know that we can implement this entirely in terms of the public interface is that we always used to do this in C++03. It was called uh, the, uh, like, you uh, swap with a temporary, essentially. Um, so what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, if our capacity is greater than our size, we create a temporary vector, moving all of the elements into it, and then swap them. So when we do that temporary vector construction, that's going to allocate the exact amount of space we need, which is what shrink to fit is supposed to do. Um, we don't want to have a vector with a capacity of a million elements, and we're only using two, and we don't expect to use a million anymore. We want to reclaim that memory. That's the goal of shrink to fit, and we can implement it entirely in terms of public functions. Yes? So the question was, isn't the point that you're supposed to use uh, realloc and uh, try to reuse some of that space? Is that, is that <laughs> essentially your question? Um, yeah, so in practice, um, I don't know that any implementations actually do that. Um, realloc, um, the problem is vector has an allocator argument. The memory you allocate has to come through the allocator. You can't call realloc on that. You can only call realloc on something you called malloc on. Um, 
Comparison operators. Operator double equal is defined as a constant time operation if the two sizes are the same. So we check that first. And if they are the same, then we compare each element, element-wise comparison, using the standard equal algorithm. We can do something similar with operator less than. It's a lexicographical compare. It just compares the first element of each, and so on and so forth, until it finds one element is less than the other, and it can return based on that. All of the other comparison operators, not equal, greater than, greater than or equal to or less than, can be implemented in terms of these two. And it's typical to implement those other operators as not equal is not double equal, and all of the others are some minor transformation of operator less than. For element access, we have the bracket operator. Now vector has random access iterators. And random access iterators are defined to have their own bracket operator. So we can defer entirely to member function begin, returns an iterator, index into that. At, all at does is check that the index that you pass in is less than the size. And if it is, it calls the bracket operator. Otherwise, it throws an exception. Front is the element at begin. And back is the element at one before, one past the end. Specialized iterators. We have C begin and C end. The goal is to make sure we get a const iterator, no matter what type of container we call it on. So as long as we have an argument that is const, for instance, if we had an overload of C begin that took a vector by const reference, we could just call begin on it and we get a const iterator. R begin and R end are defined as just construct the reverse iterator type from the other iterators. Nothing special there. CR begin, CR end, combination of the two above. Now swap. This is um, maybe one of my more contentious slides. I think member swap should be deprecated. Standard vector and all other standard containers have a member function swap that takes a single argument. The free function, there's an overload of standard swap that calls that member swap function. And my further argument is that the free function swap should rarely be specialized. And in the case of vector, it does not need to be. So let's consider what swap looks like. This is a C14 version using standard exchange, or the more familiar C11 version that moves into a temporary variable, moves the right into the left, moves the left into the right. This is the default implementation of standard swap. Yes, question. So temp, the last one should be move from temp into right. Oh, yes, yes, sorry. This uh, should say standard move temp. Um, so this is the implementation of swap that comes with your standard library. Now, when uh, people talk about the specialization of standard swap, the idea is efficiency. Now, standard vector is in many ways a lot like standard unique pointer. It manages some sort of allocated memory. Vector, different from unique pointer, has a size and a capacity. But those two are just integers, fairly trivial. So to save space on my slides, I'm going to show you unique pointer swap. Now, let's consider what a specialization of unique pointer swap looks like. This would be if we had the same arguments again, temp there instead of left-hand side. Um, and let's see what happens when the compiler actually compiles this code. Let's get rid of all of this move stuff and try to get down to just the data members, the actual data copying that's actually going on. It'll look something like this. So we start out, we create a temporary variable to store the data of the left-hand side unique pointer, and then we set left-hand side to null. This is what the move assignment operator does for unique pointer. For vector, it does the same thing, except it also copies over the size and the capacity and sets those to zero. We set the left-hand side pointer to the contents of the right-hand side pointer, and then we set that to null. That's the move assignment operator of left-hand side equals standard move right-hand side. And then we say right-hand side equals standard move temp in the previous example, so we do the same thing here. And then we call delete temp. That is what the destructor of that temporary unique pointer does. 
So people look at this and they see, look at all this code right here. We don't even need half of this stuff. So they write their own version. Looks like this. Looks much simpler. We just say, okay, I'm just going to have a regular pointer variable as a local variable. I'm going to store your pointer, and then I'm going to do a couple of pointer assignments. No need for delete, no need for all that extra null stuff. But the, I'm, I'm sorry, you said it has a bug? I thought so, yeah, because if you don't set temp to zero, the yeah. destructor is going to do something awful. Um, so the comment was that if you don't set temp to zero or null pointer, the destructor will do something awful. In this case, temp is just a regular raw pointer, oh, not a unique pointer. Right. Okay, never mind. Yeah, it's pulling out just the pointer variable from it. Now, in C++, we have this illusion. We pretend that the code that we write and the code that gets executed are the same thing. They're not. The compiler looks at this code and says, oh no, this isn't what you want to execute at all. This is completely wrong. You don't want me to execute this. I mean, look at, look at this. Like, it goes through, does data flow analysis. Let's start at the end and work backward. I say, delete temp. Right before that, you set it to null. Nothing happened in between there. Delete of a null pointer is a no op. Let's get rid of that. So, okay, now uh, you set right hand side dot pointer to temp, and right before that, you set it to null. That doesn't make any sense. Huh. That looks a lot similar to the manually written code after the compiler and the optimizer actually get done with it, doing trivial data code, data flow analysis, getting rid of dead stores. Every optimizing compiler does this. Identical to the manual swap code. There will be no difference in the generated assembly, no difference in performance. And yet the reason that people write their own specialized versions of swap for containers like Vector and for objects like Unique Pointer is because they think, I'm writing library code. I don't know how my users are going to use this. I want to make sure it's as optimum as possible. But by not doing anything extra, they already get the manual version. Yes. Would Come that on. also be true for uh, shared pointer? Uh, so the question was, would that also be too true for shared pointer? So with shared pointer, the implementation is very similar to unique pointer. Um, there is a little bit of a um, little bit of trickiness there, in that the pointer that the shared pointer or the the data that the shared pointer points to isn't necessarily, or it, it isn't your object, really. It uh, depends on how you allocated it. If you allocated it with make shared, then it's a pointer to a control block that contains your object, the shared count, and the weak count all together. If you called new specifically and constructed a shared pointer, then it's a pointer to a less efficient object that has a separate allocation for your control block. Um, but in this case, the data of the shared pointer is still just a single pointer, and it runs through the same sort of thing. The move is just doing pointer assignments and setting stuff to null. So yes, it would be the exact same for shared pointer. But doesn't it have to increment atomic counters? Not right. The question was, doesn't it have to increment atomic counters? And the answer to that is no. Um, the reason is, um, in the generic implementation of swap, we call standard move everywhere. If we copy a shared pointer, that increments a reference count. Um, but when we move it, there is no change in the reference count. So vector swap should not exist as a member function and it should not exist as a specialization. So of course it can be implemented with just the free function. The default version works. Erase is a little bit trickier. Let's consider there we go. What we want to do when we're erasing from a vector. So we don't want, if we have a range that we're erasing, we don't want to say, okay, delete that element, move everything over. Delete the next element, move everything over. That, that's not um, very good. That calls a whole lot more move assignments than we need. What we really want to do is say, okay, we're deleting this whole range, so let's just assign elements over it. And uh, in this case, we're going to move 7 to 4, 8 to 5, 9 to 6, 10 to 7, 11 to 8. And then, uh, then we can just delete the last three elements. 
So we do a move assignment, leaving the last three elements in a move from state. Who knows what the value is? Who cares? And then we delete them. So that is conceptually how the erase algorithm works for vector. The goal is minimize unnecessary shuffling. Now, we can do that. We have the algorithm standard move. Um, so standard move in C++11 means a few things. If you call standard move with just a single argument, it means cast this to an R value reference so that we can move from it. If you pass it three iterators, it means uh, move range. It's similar to standard copy that copies a source range to a destination. This is copying the range indicated from E to end into the location uh, indicated by B. So basically this is saying everything after the stuff we want to delete, move all of that back and then delete anything extra. So we can do this without touching any internals and no loss of efficiency. The single iterator version of a race can just forward to that same um, that same function we just showed using uh, the range is the element we want to delete and then the one past the end of that range is the next iterator. Clear, trivially implemented as a race begin to end. Resize. Resize is a little trickier. We have two things that are possible when we call resize. One is that we are resizing to something smaller. We have a vector that has a size of 10 elements, and we say resize 5. So we need to delete the last 5 elements. Or, the other option, we're increasing the size of the vector. And so we call in place back with no arguments that calls the default constructor in place. No unnecessary copies or moves. And then there is an overload of resize that takes an element we copy from. Looks exactly like this, except we put the argument right here. Yes. If you go back to that, so, but that one would require. How would you access what default? Never mind. Okay. The question was never mind. <laughs> um, so, push back can just be in place back. Nothing too special there. Um, in place back, we can just in place at the end of the container. Nothing too special there. Assign. Assign is a little bit trickier. There's three overloads of assign. Um, one of them takes a size and a value to copy from. So we say, we want to insert three copies of this value. One of them accepts a range expressed as a pair of iterators. And one of them is an initializer list. That's trivial to implement as the iterator pair. You just call begin and end on the initializer list. So I'm going to skip over that. Um, now, to implement this, remember, one of our original goals was code reuse and composability. So we have one version of a sign that says, add in 10 copies of this value, and one version that says, add this range. Now, I don't want to have to write that same code twice. I want to make sure that I can write it once to take full advantage of the structure of vector and try to reuse the code between those two implementations. And the answer to that comes from Eric Niebler's range library. He has a function repeat n. Generates a range that returns n copies of the value. So you would construct, you would call repeat n um, and uh, say, you know, 10 and x, and it'll return you a range that you can iterate over. It'll appear as though it has 10 elements and it makes a copy of those elements when you dereference it. Uh, so using an idea like this, we can reduce code duplication. Our assign, we create this range and we call begin and end on it to match the current interface in a real rangeified standard library. We just pass the range directly, but maintaining the current interface, we could do something like this. And then the iterator pair version has a few things it has to take into account. A few things we have to do to make sure that our implementation of assign is as efficient as it can possibly be. So first thing we want to do is say, OK, if the elements we're assigning can fit in the current size, 
then we want to try to reuse those elements. For instance, maybe it is, um, you know, the, the elements we can assign to them and reuse some of their storage. We, we don't want to delete everything because they might have resources we can reuse. So we copy everything from our range into what's currently in there and new end says uh, the result of standard copy is the distance between first and last plus begin. It's going to give us basically an iterator pointing to the new end of our container and we erase everything else because assign says I gave you this iterator pair, delete everything else, we don't need it anymore. Another possibility is that it's greater than the size but it's less than the capacity. So this has a um, little bit of magic there, my special copy n. Um, the reason for that is there's the algorithm standard copy n and it takes an input iterator, a size, and an output iterator. The problem is the return value of standard copy n is an iterator into the output range. It would give me the, um, the iterator at the end of, uh, essentially it'll give me the end iterator here. Now, we could use standard copy n and then advance our first iterator by size, but let's say this is a standard list iterator. Advancing over a standard list iterator is very, very slow. You never want to do it. In my presentation um, here last year, I gave a talk called Ownership of Memory. And I looked at the performance difference of uh, we want to maintain a sorted vector or a sorted standard list. And you may have seen uh, Bjarne Strustrup gave a, a similar presentation. And the end result was that it was faster to find the insertion point in the middle of a vector and insert, shifting half of the elements on average, than it was to insert into the middle of a standard list. And the reason is that iterating over standard list is so slow, because you're jumping around in random locations in memory and ruining your cache, that it's actually faster to shift half of your elements, even when your container grows up into millions of elements. So y we really don't want to call standard advance on an iterator that might just be an input, uh, a forward iterator rather. So my special copy n, unfortunately here we have to re-implement the copy n algorithm, but rather than returning the iterator corresponding with this range, we just return the iterator corresponding with this range. So we have middle, which is somewhere in the middle of the range first and last. Everything extra we call insert on. Yes? Copy n should actually be returning both iterators as a pair. So the, the, comment, the comment was that uh, in uh, Alex Stepanov it said that uh, standard copy n should actually be returning both iterators as a pair. Um, I, sorry that he didn't do it. Yeah, and he's sorry that he didn't do it, yes. Um, Eric Niebler um, feels the same way, I believe. His general view, uh, and mine as well, is that when an algorithm computes information that might be useful, as a side effect of doing whatever it is it does, it should return you that information rather than throwing it away. The problem here is that standard copy n computes the end of both ranges as far as that size is concerned, but it only gives you back one of them. So there's information that was gained for free in the implementation that we lose. So now the third case is that we need to reallocate. Now for this case, we just call the move assignment operator a standard vector. Um, it is uh, very difficult to try to come up with a way to reuse storage that doesn't actually hurt your performance. The problem is we know there's going to be a reallocation. Um, so we want to just put the elements where they're going to be. We don't want to try to put them in here to reuse element storage and then move them again. So th there isn't really too much better that we can do than just constructing a vector and move assigning it. Um, insert has a few different overloads. Maybe we can do uh, a little bit of code reuse here. Most of them we can just call in place, similar to push back and in place back, insert and in place. Um, insert 
again, takes a, a count and a value, same with a, the assign overload we looked at, and initialize a list. That's all simple. Now, the one, uh, the one tricky version of insert takes two iterator pairs. This is the naive version. This is very bad. Don't do this. Um, this says, okay, I'm going to insert at the correct position. Um, well, actually, pretend like that said plus plus at the end of position. Um, I'm going to insert at the position, shift everything over, insert at the position, shift everything over. We're shifting everything over proportional to the range, the size of the range first to last. This actually violates the complexity guarantees that the standard gives you for insert. Don't do this. Maybe we can do something better if we take advantage of standard algorithm. There's a little known algorithm called rotate. Takes three iterators, first, middle, and last, and moves them like that. So there's the arrows, the values would end up looking like this, and it returns the new end of that range. So rather than one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it's one, two, five, six, seven, three, four. So maybe we can take advantage of this in our insert. So we think, okay, I'm gonna use a, I'm gonna use insert. I'm going to add some elements to the end, and uh, then I'm gonna rotate them into position. Um, does anybody uh, see any problems with this algorithm? Okay. Correct. This is a trap. Iterator invalidation is a very scary thing with vectors. You have to be sure whenever you're inserting, reserving, resizing, anything like that, that you're not holding around any iterators from before that operation unless you know there is more capacity. We could try again. Um, that actually had two iterator invalidations previously. Um, problem. Oops. This uh, original end was also invalidated. Um, so actually, uh, let's pretend like we fixed this up then. Instead of having target, we uh, get a size, and then here we say begin plus that size. Yes? Does it construct and then a copy? Exactly. Still a trap. This is our insertion algorithm. We add it to the end. And then we do a whole bunch of swaps to put it into the right spot. What we really want to do is take all of this data, move it into the extra space, and then insert the elements directly where we want. Now, there is no way to do this with standard vectors interface. And to understand why, we have to consider what is the goal of member functions and friend functions? What are they trying to do? What are they allowed to do? I'm sorry, what's that? An efficient basis. Is it an efficient basis? Um, I would agree with that, but I don't think that's entirely what they do. So they maintain invariance. maintain invariance, exactly. So what we would need to be able to build up an insertion algorithm, we would need one operation that moves data and leaves a three element hole in the middle. If there's a hole in the middle, now all of our invariants that says every element between begin and end is a valid element in the vector are broken. There is no member function that allows us to do that. So anything that insertion would need to build upon could not exist and maintain vectors and variants at the same time. So this one insertion algorithm um, overload has to be either a member or a friend. So We've gone through a whole bunch of functions there. A um, whole bunch of functions in vector. And found a whole bunch that can be implemented entirely in terms of other member functions. At this point, let us consider. What is left? What functions haven't we looked at yet? Well, other than the constructors and assignment operators, we have begin, end, and data. So three functions that deal with the data itself and accessing it. Get allocator, capacity, and reserve, three member functions related to storage, the, the actual capacity. Um, and then one overload of insert in place, 
and pop back. So three functions related to adding and removing elements. So nine member functions out of all of the functions we've looked at and all of their overloads. This is all that actually needs to touch the internals of Vector and be both correct and efficient. That's what we talked about before, providing an efficient basis. Now, we went through standard Vector. Um, what does that give us now that we know all of this? Well, it gives us nice benefits to the implementation of Vector. Um, we can be more confident that our algorithms are correct because we're reusing pieces that individually we've verified are correct. We're only building on nine or you know, 12 or so functions when you factor in uh, assignment and, and construction. Um, we're only building on a small set of functions that are actually modifying the internals. A small set of functions that at any time can have vector in an invalid state. So we have fewer functions that we need to audit closely for taking vector out of a valid state of breaking its invariance at some point. So we have those nice benefits, reusability, modularity, all that. But that's not it. What about other containers? What about when we're not just talking about vector? What if we're thinking about array and dec and list and forward list? All of the sequence containers or things that are like sequence containers in the case of array and forward list. Well, let, let's go through those functions and take another look at them, but with an eye not just to vector, but to every container. Size, end minus begin, that works for array, that works for deck. In fact, that works for anything with a random access iterator. Standard distance would give us a linear time size, that's why we don't want to use it here. Because any function that has, or any class rather, that has a size member function in the standard guarantees that size is a constant time operation. Um, previous to C++11, standard list was unspecified whether it was constant time or linear time. The standard recommended constant time, but GCC, for example, had a linear time implementation. And the reason for that was being able to give constant time splice in more situations. But now with C++11, if you have size, it's constant time. So standard list has to have a member variable and the size function has to return that. So standard list can't reuse our size function, but dec and array can. That's nice. Empty. I said begin equals end for a particular reason rather than size equals zero. Works for forward list. Forward list doesn't have a size function, but it does have a begin and an end, and you can compare them in constant time. Everything that wants to look container-like and work with a standard library operates on this concept of begin and end iterators. We know that you're going to have begin and end, and the only way you can be empty is if those two are the same. So this will work with every container in the standard library, and it works with everything that looks like a container that I might write, or that any of you might write. Max size works exactly the same. Comparison operators, if it has a size function, this will work. So this will work with every container, except forward list. For forward list, we'd have to create a different version that uses the four iterator version of standard equal. Um, operator less than, is defined as lexicographical compare for every container, not just standard vector. And these operators, the other operators, can be implemented in terms of these two. And in fact, for almost any class, these operators can be implemented in terms of these two. Element access. Sequence containers only have the bracket operator if they have random access iterators. So this will work with anything for which the bracket operator is defined. At will work with anything for which the bracket operator is defined. Front works with anything. Back works with any container. Does not work with forward list. Forward list doesn't provide back because there is no way to get constant time access to the back of a forward list. You can't go backward. It's a forward, a singly linked list. So this code wouldn't compile for forward list, you wouldn't be able to use it. 
specialized iterators, cbegin, cn, etc. Works for every container. <coughs> every reversible container, anyway, for the reverse iterators. Swap. Use the default. Shouldn't be specialized anyway for any of these containers. Erase. Here's our erase implementation for vector. This uh, works for vector. It mostly works for deck. It'll give you the right results, but it's not as efficient as it could be. Um, the reason is that with deck, you can erase from the back, or you can erase from the front. You can go either way. So if I pass in a range that's at the beginning of the deck, I don't want to have to slide everything over. I just want to chop off the beginning and not have any moves in there. So we'd want a slightly different implementation. But again, our goal is code reuse. So maybe we could reuse this implementation. And so a standard deck erase would say, OK, if B is closer, or rather, if E is closer to end than B is to begin, use this algorithm, break this out into like erase from end or something. I, I don't know the best name for it, but we could come up with a name of saying erase and slide everything from the end toward the beginning. And if B is close to begin, then E is to end, then we do it the other way. Rather than calling standard move with the end, we'd say standard move backward, begin to B. Same sort of idea, instead of pop back, pop front. We can reuse this code. And uh, yeah, it'll work, for, it'll work for deck. Now for list, things are a little bit different. For vector and deck, our goal is erase a big chunk of data at a time so we can slide everything over once. Standard list doesn't work that way. Standard list is a node-based container. So we would actually want to implement the range-based version in, in terms of the single iterator version, which would look something like this, some magic internal unlink call. So the single argument um, iterator erase for standard list does need access to internals, whereas for vector and deck it doesn't. So we have a little bit of a conundrum, a little bit of um, inconsistency here of how we should proceed. And I'll get to that later of what my recommendation to do in this situation would be. Now for non-node-based containers, the erase we define for vector for a single iterator works for them just fine too. Clear, erase everything from begin to end, works fine for every container. Every erasable container anyway. Um, standard array, can't erase from it. But let's, yes? So that right there, so for a vector, say a vector of n, so a vector of a trivial type. Yes. That should be an O of 1 operation. Yes. But the, your erase function is not an O of 1 operation. Okay, so the comment was that um, clear for a vector of a trivially destructible type, such as int, should be a constant time operation. But on the surface, this algorithm looks like a linear time operation. We have to iterate over every element. So let's go back to what our range-based erase looks like and look at it from the compiler's perspective. Look at it from the optimizer's perspective and see, OK, so we're erasing everything from begin to end. So we say uh, move everything from begin to end um, and uh, move back to the beginning. So it's moving to its own location. No op. Doesn't do anything there. Um, so then all we have is while begin does not equal end, pop back. OK. That's where uh, another linear time operation there. We have to call pop back for every element in the vector. But what does popback actually do? Inside of popback, it's just two lines. First line is call the destructor of the object um, using the explicit destructor call syntax. Second line, decrement size by one. 
Now, the destructor of a trivially destructible type is empty. Function call with empty body, trivially removable by a compiler. Looks at it, says there's nothing in the body of this destructor. There is no destructor for int. Emit no code. So then, what this function says is while begin does not equal end, decrement size. Now, if you have an implementation where it stores a pointer to the data and a size, then end is just going to be the pointer plus the size. So this essentially reads then, while pointer to data does not equal pointer to data plus size, decrement size does reduction on that, remove the pointer from both sides and say, while zero does not equal size, decrement size. Um, as anybody who has ever tried to profile C++ code knows, the compiler is really good at getting rid of that. You can type a for, you can have a, a test in there. You say, I want to know how fast my compiler does looping with optimizations turned on. So I say for n equals zero, n does not equal, let's say, 7 trillion, um, assuming we have a 64-bit integer type that we're assigning it to, plus plus n. How long do you think that's going to take to execute? No time at all. Compiler looks at your loop, says, not doing anything, going to take it out. Even though you have that increment in there, it says, okay, you're zero, increment up to there. I know what you mean. I know what you meant to write. You meant to write the right code where all it is is a single addition or a single subtraction. You, you didn't really want to increment it a thousand times. You just want to say plus a thousand. And that's fine. So the compiler looks at this and says, oh, okay. So while zero does not equal size, minus minus size, essentially the same as nothing, gets rid of that code too. Trivially destructible types won't actually do anything there. And then it gets to the end. It says, oh, okay, I'm cleared. Everything is good. Clear doesn't get rid of the capacity. We don't have to deallocate that. So we're all happy. Yes? Um, debug version performance, especially at the library, is the issue. So the comment was that uh, debug performance of the library um, is an issue. I agree. Um, now, the answer to that, I guess, you still could implement this entirely with free functions if you want that without looking at the implementation. There's a type trait in C++11. Uh, standard is trivially destructible. So we can have one overload, of, or one, uh, I guess, uh, sphenade uh, enable lift out or um, tag dispatched or however you want to do it where you have two versions of clear that are selected at compile time one that says if the type is trivially destructible then uh, we don't really have to do anything there we can just reduce the size and uh, we have one version that says if it is trivially destructible then we actually do go through and call the destructor um, yeah, so use, using these type traits, we can query this at compile time. It doesn't matter if you're in debug or release mode at that point. You're, as a library implementer, making sure that things are supposed to be constant time are constant time. Yes? So if we're going for the smallest possible set of member functions which have access to private parts, Maybe we could introduce a, a pop bag that takes an integer argument, which is the number of elements to pop. So the comment was, if our goal is to implement standard vector with the fewest amount of member functions possible, then we could implement a pop back that contains a size. It says, you know, pop back five elements or pop back seven elements or whatever. Is that mm -hmm. you're suggesting? Um, we could. Yes. Um, so far. Um, all of these implement functions in terms of other functions haven't changed the interface of anything. Um, that, that sort of thing, like that along with append, are fairly common operations that people have to roll their own for with vector. Um, 
yeah, so like I, I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to that. That would just be adding an extra function, which is kind of beyond what we're doing here. Yeah. Yes? So if it is trivially destructible, you said like, you know, move the size to zero, but which memory function allows you to do that? OK. Which public function? So the question was, if it is trivially destructible, our goal is to just move the size to zero. And which member function allows you to do that? OK. Um, yeah, that is, a, that is a good point. Um, so yes, in that case, for debug performance, we would need to pull in erase, I guess. That would be the function to do that just subs subtracts the size. Or add a new function, yeah. Uh, or or swap it with an empty container. But you lose the capacity. Yeah, the comment was, or you could swap it with an empty container, but then you lose the capacity in your vector, which is a valuable resource that you want to hold on to if possible. So pop back end looks like it's useful. Yes, the, the comment was pop back end then looks useful. Um, it, it, it is a pattern that I use fairly regularly as well, just in my regular use of of a vector, I want to get the last some number of elements out of it. Uh. Okay, so we have clear. Um, let's consider resize for other containers. Um, for containers like, um, well, yeah, for any container, this uh, the same idea works. Um, or if we want to take advantage of the erase function that uh, we were talking about, get that access to the internal details for a uh, faster debug performance, then we, wanna, we would want to rewrite this while loop in terms of the erase overload. Um, and uh, now the, the other way, though, going resize and increasing the elements, um, that works for any container that you can add to. Anything within place back, this implementation works just fine for that as well. Push back, calling in place back works for every container. In place back, calling in place back at the end works for every container. This assign function, again, works for every container. Nothing special going on here. And uh, this assign function, on the other hand, the version that takes two iterators, um, this has a lot of the um, understanding of the structure of vector to try to make this more efficient. That. Um, we wouldn't necessarily want or be able to use all of this for every container. For instance, only vector has a capacity function. So trying to reuse the capacity doesn't make any sense. So this version of assign, we would have to re-implement for other containers. But let's consider what we've done. We wrote code thinking only of vector, and we ended up with if you include a race to have maximal debug mode performance, member functions. And in doing so, we simplified every other container in the standard library. If we could make this a free function, if we could say, I'm going to write a size function that works for everything. Um, so what that gives us is a simpler standard library implementation for one. That's good. But it also means that if a user wants to write their own container-like object, for instance, let's say I want to write a static vector, a vector-like object that has a fixed at compile time size. So it's backed by a standard array, but it can grow and shrink within that capacity. You know, I've used that container fairly regularly. You can get pretty good performance improvements if you know that you're always going to have, say, six elements or less. No dynamic allocation required. I do that. I only write the nine or 
10 functions that I need, and I get the rest of the standard library interface for free. Automatically works with my types. I don't have to think about all of this stuff that we went through of exactly how do I implement this, exactly what is the right sequence of functions to call to make sure that it works for my container. Just works. Yes? An input iterator, yes. So the comment was that the member version of vector assign only requires an input iterator, whereas here I've used a forward iterator. Yes. So the way that we would implement this is a little bit more complicated than I showed here. However, the forward iterator version is very simple. You cannot do more than, or sorry, the input iterator version is very simple because you cannot do more than one pass over an input iterator. So right here, we have used up our input range. We called standard distance, the range is now used up. Consider um, an iStream iterator. Um, gives you the element, and as soon as you increment it, that element's gone, it's waiting for a new element. You can't go over it again and get those elements back. So there are a lot of different um, tricks that you can use with functions and template metaprogramming and tag dispatching or enable if to try to select the best overload depending on what type your template argument is. This is essentially the problem that concepts are supposed to solve. Um, so the input iterator case would just be this. Just be this one line here. So if it's an input iterator, we do this. If it's a forward iterator or better, we do the full function. Because this is the one version that makes a single pass. Um, the other algorithms require having this count ready to be able to efficiently reuse the space that Vector already has. Um, any other version that we try to use will either move our elements around unnecessarily or um, have to go over the range twice, which simply isn't allowed. Yes? So I have a comment. Um, we just went through all this three function implementation of all these things. And we considered for, OK, if it is a vector-like container, this is good. If it's a list-like container, it's not good. So if you implement your own container and all these things come for free, now I have to go through the code to make sure that it's efficient for my container. Even though it'll just work out of the box, it may not be efficient for me. So the comment was, we have all of this code, and if we make it to where it can pick up any user-defined containers, then I write my own container. And if my container is written a certain way, then it'll work and it'll be fine. But if it's written another way, this code won't work for me. And whereas right now, if we try to use it, we get a compile error. If we have free functions over everywhere that are accepting any sort of user-defined type and calling these functions on them, it might do the wrong thing. Um, is that a fair assessment of your point? Okay. So for most of these, for um, essentially everything we've looked at except for erasing from a linked list, um, the algorithm I showed was either correct for every container in the standard library and every thing that looks like a container that I've ever written, or it doesn't compile. For instance, that's why when we do the implementation of size, we say end minus begin. We could say standard distance, but in the case of a structure uh, without random access iterators like standard list, it would compile, it would appear to work, but it would be a performance bug. You'd have a linear time size. Um, one of the important concepts that the C++ standard library uses is that um, the performance characteristics, the big O time and space complexity of an algorithm is actually part of its interface. So no matter what I have, if I have a container and it has a size function, it is constant time. We know that, it's guaranteed. For, like, we, we have these guarantees on our algorithms. We know that standard sort has to be average case complexity and log n. Can't do any worse than that on average. So we can 
take advantage of these things in our algorithms, um, knowing that, in general, if it would be a performance bug, it won't compile. Now, there are some cases that isn't true. Um, and that is a problem. However, um, right now, you have to go through and implement all of these functions um, as part of implementing a container. Um, it would be possible to make this an opt-in system as opposed to an opt-out or an opt-in to something else system. Um, right now, so far, I haven't specified any way of saying that something is container-like and we should be able to use all of these container algorithms on it. That is one of the um, issues with um, the, uh, one of the, I guess, problems that the concepts proposal is facing trying to decide what it means to say that your type meets some concept. So far, I've just been talking in kind of the abstract, if it's a container, it'll do this and things will work. Um, the way that you could implement this, there's a few different ways. Um, it depends on, I guess, what trade-offs you want to make. If you don't have to opt into it, then for most containers where it does do the right thing, you don't have to do anything extra and it just works. If your goal is, I never want to accidentally introduce a performance bug, which is a perfectly valid goal, where code that looks like it does the right thing but maybe does it slower, um, then we would have some sort of opt-in system. You say, like, you know, you add to your type some sort of tag that says, I'm a container. Or you specialize some traits class. There's a lot of different options and if you are interested in exactly how to solve this problem I would recommend that you go through the concepts proposal um, they talk a lot about exactly how you would solve this and like the discussion around it of um, how do you specify that something meets a concept outside of just code does this code compile like there's the syntax and there's like do your functions compile and then there's what do they actually mean? And are the semantics behind the syntax what we are actually requiring for our algorithm? So, so some of the, um, the time complexities that we discussed, it's fine gran finer granular than a big O notation. I mean, even if it is a linear, we are saying, OK, we are doing unnecessary copy. We can optimize <laughs> it, right? So we may not capture it saying, OK, it's linear, but my container, I can do better than linear. Mm. So the, the comment was that Big O notation is um, useful in general, but it, it, it's very coarse-grained. It doesn't give you all of the information. And I agree, just like the example I brought up before of inserting into the middle of a list in a vector where you search to find the spot. They both have linear time complexity because of that linear search. The vector does a whole lot better because of better caching effects um, in the search. So yeah, I agree that big O complexity isn't everything, and that's actually we're starting to move toward that more with uh, C++ 17. For instance, our iterator categories in C++ 14 and earlier, we have input iterator, forward iterator, bidirectional iterator, and random access iterator. C++ 17 adds contiguous iterator, which is an even more refined concept. Based on just the code and based on just time complexity of operations, the random access iterator and the contiguous iterator appear the same. But we have a special way of annotating iterators to say, this iterator is a contiguous iterator, as opposed to just a random access iterator. And I think we need a similar sort of thing for containers. You would say, this container is a node-based container. And node-based containers, different from vector, deck, array, static vectors, any other containers and container-like objects, you need to do the algorithm slightly differently for them. Does that answer your question? OK. Are there, are there any other questions about the point? Yes. So uh, we want to go from a v dot size to size of v. I'm afraid that it's going to become std scope size of v. 
Okay, um, I will address that concern a little bit later. So hold on to that. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to see how pushback breaks under this model, you know, if, if it's full. And the second thing is, wouldn't an is full make sense for any container? Because at the very least, you have um, memory constraints. You know, you were, you were figuring out this max element. Okay. So the, the two questions or comments were, um, the first one was with the static vector I was talking about that has a fixed to compile time size, what happens when you push back when it's full? Um, the answer to that is it throws standard bad alloc. Um, it's essentially, its allocator model is, allocates all the space ahead of time on the stack, and that's all the space it can possibly allocate, so if you ask for more, you're requesting a reallocation, it can't happen, it fails, throws an exception. That's kind of the, the general design that I use and that I've seen similar ideas use. Now for your um, second um, comment, um, could you, I'm sorry, repeat it again? Is full. Oh, is full, okay. So the question was, uh, do we, should we have some sort of is full for containers? Like we have this max size function, so it'd be useful to check, is the container currently full? Um, that is very difficult um, to do quickly or at all. Um, as far as I know, there is no easy way to find out if you can allocate more memory without doing all of the work necessary to allocate more memory. Um, like Memory management on modern systems is very complicated. Um, we try to simplify things for our own sanity of working with it and um, for performance. We try to have, okay, we have this, uh, this region of memory is going to have allocations that are um, 64 bytes in size or 4 kilobytes or, you know, similar sized regions and then we have to track, oh, okay, this region of memory has been given out to someone and this region isn't and so over time we get memory fragmentation and then we try to defragment and like get back contiguous regions of memory so we can process a full request but let's say for instance you have a standard vector and it's one gigabyte and I say push back and it's full. The typical strategy, well the strategy that everyone has to use is multiply the current capacity by some factor. Uh, the factor used in GCC is 2. Um, you can argue over whether 2 is a good decision or not, but that is what a lot of implementations use. They say when it's full, double our size, which means that for some period of time we need to have the 1 gigabyte vector around plus uh, the extra 2 gigabytes that we're trying to reserve. So even if we have total two gigabytes of free space, or even total three gigabytes of free space, that doesn't necessarily mean that we could allocate the extra two gigabytes. So like being able to check, is it full, can I allocate more, is very difficult. Unless you're trying to ask um, just, is the current number of elements equal to our, my reserved capacity? Then in the case of vector, that's just size equals capacity. In the case of node-based structures, the question doesn't really make sense, there is no capacity. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah. I was just thinking in terms of this little limited model of yours, it, it does kind of make sense. I think the is full idea it does, but I suppose it doesn't generally. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe there's a type of full container or a fillable container or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, the, the comment was that um, in the case of like a static vector, it's trivially implementable. Um, in the case of vector, it's a little bit more challenging, but it might still be useful. Um, I think that a more useful operation might be um, something like, um, would inserting this number of elements cause a reallocation, maybe? No, that, that wasn't your point. OK. Okay, sorry. What I was saying is that if, if for a vector, it would return um, full only if the next request would exceed the max size as returned by the existing max size. OK, the comment was that it is full would return uh, true if the next request uh, for size would exceed the max size of the vector. Which is yeah. <coughs> yeah, and, and yeah. So it's it's not too generally useful. It might be useful if you have a fixed size container. Yeah. Yes, I. No, no, same, same thing. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's also com the the correct is full is not doable for vector because you have a race condition. Uh, so the only way to check whether a vector is full is to try and fail. The, so the comment was, for vector is full, you could check if it's true now, but there's a race condition because you check, okay, is it full? Is it possible for me to allocate more? Um, that, that's in the case of if you're trying to determine well, whether you can actually fine. allocate in the current system I'm as opposed to the fine. max so size function. Yeah. It's not useful. That's assuming your vector is threat safe from the Because otherwise there's already a race. <laughs> Uh, well, no, so the comment was that that's assuming your vector is thread safe. I, I think his point was more just that um, your vector doesn't have to be thread safe, but your memory allocator as a whole for your system does. So I can say, can I allocate more memory? It says yes, and then I allocate memory and it can still fail because someone else allocated memory in that time. So, yes. Um, now, I had said earlier that I was going to talk about when, uh, there we go. Um, when you should make something a member function, when you should make it a free function, when you should make it a, a friend free function, um, and then I'd go into syntax. So. By the current language rules, there are certain things that have to be members. So no matter how much we would like to, we have to implement them as members. These four operators must always be members, no matter what. Um, I, uh, I am working on a proposal, actually, um, to allow, at the very least, the bracket operator and the arrow operator to be free functions. Um, for instance, we can have the reference operator, operator star, as a free function, but not the arrow operator. That seems pretty inconsistent. Um, and for a lot of types that I write, actually, for instance, if you write standard vector, as I showed earlier, you don't need access to any internals for operator bracket. We already have a lot of other operators available as free functions. There's no reason to restrict, at the very least, those two. Some people may um, specially object to the assignment operator. Um, but yeah, at the very least, bracket operator and arrow operator should not have to be members. Um, so regardless, under the current version of the standard, they do have to be. So guideline number one, everyone agrees to this. If it has to be a member, make it a member. You don't have a choice. This also includes virtual functions, although there have been uh, some presentations here um, about uh, open methods. Um, for instance, the, the YOM 11 uh, library allows you to write a virtual-like free function. Um, there is a little bit of overhead, but not that much. I encourage you to watch the presentation if you're more interested. But using the C++ syntax, virtual has to be a member. Those member operators I just showed. Constructors have to be members. Um, and so my second recommendation if it can be a non-friend function, make it free. But only if you can do so with no loss of efficiency. For instance, it was possible for us to make a valid version of insert that only used 
the public interface, but we can do a better version by accessing the internals and we should do so. Um, yes? Destructor? Yes, constructor and destructor, okay. yes. Okay. Yes, uh-huh. Um, <laughs> now, so far, this is the same advice that Scott Myers wrote um, in his article, uh, How Non-Member Functions Increase Encapsulation. And it's the same argument that Herb Sutter gave in Monoliths Unstrung. Now, where I differ is in this last guideline. The last guideline that they gave is otherwise make it a member function. Mine is otherwise maximize consistency. What I mean, consider size. We can make it a non-member function for vector, a non-member non-friend function for vector, deck, anything with a random access iterator. For standard list, it needs access to the internals. So I would say size should be a non-member friend function for consistency among all containers. Insert. Only one overload of insert needs access to the internals. There's six versions of insert, I believe. All of the others forward to the one version or they forward to in place. So I would make all of those other overloads non-member, non-friends, and the one version that does need access, make it a friend. Um, in the uh, Myers article, Monoliths Unstrung, when he looks at all the different overloads, he says, okay, we'll make these 53 overloads, or however many there are, of string replace or free functions, and this one version is a member function. I would rather have a consistent syntax. Now, some people might object to this because friend functions violate encapsulation. And I agree, actually, they do. But so do member functions. I think when you write a member function or when you write a free function, you should kind of feel bad. You should look and see, can I implement this with just the public interface? But you can't implement everything with the public interface. At some point, you need to violate encapsulation by accessing internals. We can't have everything being private. So free functions and member functions are on the exact same footing in here. They are, other than a few language rules, primarily just a difference in syntax. Now, there was a proposal, a few proposals really, to minimize or eliminate that difference in syntax. It's referred to as the uniform function call syntax. There are two papers, one of them by Bjarne Strustrup and one of them by Herb Sutter. They were pretty similar, but they do have some important differences. The commonalities, first, the idea is we want to allow people to write free functions and still give them either the benefits of member functions or um, allow changing, for instance, the standard library. We have all of these member functions that don't need to be members. If we had unified function call syntax, they could be made free functions. So the idea here is when you call x.f, it first looks for member function f in class x. And if it doesn't exist, then it looks for a free function f that accepts an x as the first argument. This would allow backwards compatible changes. This would allow the standard library, the, for instance, vector, to be re-implemented. All of the functions I just showed could be free functions instead of members. We could immediately shrink the amount of code in the standard library, and users wouldn't notice. That's the general idea that's similar between both proposals. Now, where they differ is also kind of important. Strustrup's proposal says if you say f of x using a free function call, it first looks for member function f, and then it looks for a free function f that accepts an x, identical to the member function call syntax. Strustrup's goal was maximizing consistency. No matter what kind of function you're trying to call, you use the exact same syntax for it. It doesn't matter, free function or member function, you use them the same way, you access them the same way, member function, then free function. The idea is 
get rid of the differences between free function call and member function call syntax. Um, this, for instance, follows the range-based for loop rules for begin and end. When you use a range-based for loop, it first looks and says, do you have a uh, dot .begin and dot .end member? No, you don't? Okay, let me try a free function begin and end. Um, what this means is that member functions hide free functions with the same name. Um, there have been some people who are opposed to this idea precisely for this reason. Because one of the things that it means is that adding a member function to a class becomes a breaking change. Someone somewhere may have written a free function with that same name. I add member function foo and it hides their free function foo. Um, paper also considers removing inaccessible members from overload resolution. Um, essentially, if there's a private function somewhere, it's not going to hide my functions. It's an implementation detail. It shouldn't be part of the interface. That was the, the general idea of Strustrup's proposal. Now, Sutter has a slightly different idea. He says, leave the free function syntax alone. Don't touch that. Um, his goal is backwards compatibility. Now, where his proposal extends Strustrup's proposal, where it's slightly different, is when you say x dot a, under both of their proposals, that can call f of x comma a. It can put the object as the first argument. Now, Sutter went a little bit farther and said, okay, um, that's all well and good, but I would also like to be able to call x dot f of a and have it find f of a comma x. Put it into any position. Um, one of the motivating examples that he gave for this was um, like the C standard library. The idea is um, there's a lot of code out there that um, uses the C standard library, for instance, uh, files. But the C standard library is inconsistent of where that file pointer argument goes. Is it the first argument or the second argument? We could change this to, you can just say, file, arrow, open parens, the other arguments. Have bring consistency to the C standard library. Now, last week in uh, Linuxa, um, people talked over these proposals a bit and as far as I can tell, the current version of unified call syntax that is being considered is the intersection of bro both proposals, just that very first slide. The argument has to be in the first position and it doesn't touch free functions. It's kind of a, a slimmed down version of both of them. It's not guaranteed to be in C++17 or C++53 or any future version. It's still something under consideration. Um, so your question earlier um, was about like my preferred syntax. Um, so one of the reasons for these proposals has to do with code completion. There's real benefits from using member function syntax and there's real benefits from writing functions as free functions. The member function syntax comes at the call site and the free function benefit comes when you define the function. And so the goal is, let's bring these two together. You can, when you're defining the function, write it as a free function to get the benefits of encapsulation and code reuse among different data structures. But at the call site, we can still use the member function syntax. Now, the benefit of that is, as I said, code completion. When I say x dot, uh, Sutter's um, argument is there are a specific amount of things that can follow that. It's some sort of function, um, right now, member function, in the future, um, any function that can accept an x, anything that's valid to pass that to. There's a limited number of things. We know we're able to do this because we're already doing something a lot like this. Um, whereas using the free function syntax, I say f open parens, what does your IDE autocomplete for you? What does it suggest? It could be any local variable that is of that type, or maybe I actually want to call f of g of x, or f of g plus 3 of x. Essentially, any expression is valid at that point, and 
it's essentially an almost unbounded list of things that theoretically could go there. The compiler, the IDE rather, is less able to provide you useful auto-completion when you use the free function syntax at your call site. Yes? I have a proposal for that. Uh, what about saying that uh, I type open parenthesis, A, comma, B, close parenthesis, and at that point, uh, the IDE suggests a list of applicable functions? So the idea was that I could type open parens, the arguments, close parens, and then the IDE says, oh, okay, let me try to autocomplete functions you could possibly call with that argument. Okay. Um, that is an interesting idea, but unlike when you call the member function syntax, that is requiring you to type out all of the arguments before you get the function completion. Mm -hmm. Maybe I just know, okay, so I have this class, um, some important class in my application, and uh, you know, so I have class, I type dot, and then it automatically gives me a list of useful functions. And as soon as I find the function I want, I say open parens, and then it shows me all of those secondary arguments that I want to do. Whereas if I have to type in all the arguments, I lose that benefit. Um, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad proposal, just it doesn't get you everything that member function syntax gives you for code completion purposes. I thought about it 10 seconds, but I'm sure that it's possible to improve on the idea. Okay, yeah, the comment was, you sure it's possible to improve on the idea, and I'm, I'm sure it is as well. Um, but yeah, that's just the, I guess, the state of IDEs right now. There's a lot of focus on member function completion because that's where a lot of our functions are right now. Um, now, without unified call syntax, um, we lose this code completion benefit. It's much harder to complete free function syntax calls than member function syntax calls. However, I believe that with free functions, the benefits we get from maximizing code reuse and maximizing encapsulation outweighs those downsides. It allows us to write things that are similar to the standard library a lot easier and leverage the algorithms that they wrote. Um, it allows us to minimize the copy and paste that currently occurs in the standard library just because something is defined as a member function. Um, so I believe that in general we'll have better interfaces and better code reuse by preferring free functions where possible. Um, and I'm available for any questions. Uh, yes? Well, uh, in fact, you did not answer my question. Uh, okay. So I wholeheartedly agree with all you said, but I'm worried that if I go from v dot size to size of v, okay, it already annoys me enough to have to start to type std scope vector. Yep. I'm afraid it would have to become std scope size of v. Okay, so the comment had to do with namespace qualification of functions. So with a member function size, I can say v dot size, open parens, close parens. Now with the free function size, the free function would have to be in the namespace std. So we'd have to say std colon colon size, open parens, v, close size. Um, now that is not always true. Um, <coughs> for the standard library, for anything in namespace std, um, you can take advantage of argument dependent lookup. You can say just size open parens v close parens. Um, and that will find std size. Now the problem with that is that it only works for types that have at some part of their name something in namespace std. If I define my special container in my own namespace, it's not going to find std size. Um, so yeah, that, in that case, yes, would be um, more typing on that side. Uh, e e even if the container is in namespace std, uh, you don't get ADL for template, func for function templates, right? Uh, or do you? Uh, well, um, I, I wonder, when you're going to, 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 to define uh, size, the free uh, member, uh, the, the free function size, are you going to make it uh, something like a template uh, class container size, or are, are you going to 
restricted via enable if or via uh, overloading based on concepts? Um, yeah, so the, the question was uh, when you have this free function size, exactly how would we specify the type? If we had concepts, mm -hmm. then yeah, we would overload it on the concept of like container. Um, without concepts, then we would want something more like an enable if solution, which is basically the C++11, C++14 version of concepts, of trying to say only enable this if this is true. Are there any other questions? Yes. So stepping away from people who write a standard library, I write plain old ordinary code. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have coworkers who've been adopting this idea of things ought to be free functions. What I have observed is that repeatedly because I'm working without an IDE, I'm using just a standard text editor. Uh, if I want to find what free functions operate on this particular object, it has become very difficult to look at. Uh, do you have any guidance uh, or observations on that particular function? So again, stepping away from mm -hmm. I'm writing for the standard library so I can go to my reference manual, mm -hmm. you know, DC++ standard library. Uh, now what I have is whatever some developer happens to leave behind in some place that I haven't looked at. So the comment was, how do I find these free functions? Um, so in C++, free functions are there. Like when we use the algorithm header, they're there. Anytime that someone, for instance, isn't writing the class, is writing the functions, they have to be free. Um, now, to say that things are related, we have a few options. You can put them in the same namespace, for instance. Or you could still forward declare these free functions that operate on this class in the header if it's generally useful to all of your users, like vector size. Vector size is pretty useful to users of vector, so it might make sense to include size in the vector header. Or if we're reusing size, then vector includes like some sort of container algorithms header that operates on containers in general. Um, so yeah, I, I think the solution to that problem, and I, in a lot of the coding I do, I also just use a text editor and the terminal. Um, you, if they're generally useful, you put them in the same header as the class. Um, that doesn't have to change. If they're more specialized, then just like you can do now, you can make it just a local function in your CPP file. If all it is is related to this one computation I'm doing and I don't expect it to be that useful for other people. Or you can use directory structures and namespaces to say, you know, this is my class person and these are all different types of functions that you might be interested in that operate on people. Like, you know, this one is related to their jobs and this one's related to them eating and this one's related to them sleeping. Like, no matter what, this problem exists and you need to have, um, like a higher level organization of how you put things together to be able to find it kind of no matter what system you're using. Um, I believe I have time for just one more question. Um, just sort of following up, I, I think one of the downsides of this uniform call syntax is that if, if you're not using an IDE, it becomes a little bit more difficult to know, oh, I need to look up this method. Well, it might not really be a method. You know, it may be a free function somewhere. So you, you could have somebody who's not as experienced in C++ who's looking for this, this member function and can't find it and it hasn't occurred to them, oh, it's, it's this free function. So the comment was that with unified call syntax, it can make it difficult for people who aren't using an IDE to actually find out what is being called. Like it looks like a member function call syntax, but it's actually a free function. Um, that could be a problem. Um, Hopefully, people who are coding without an IDE are using other tools that are like grepping their source code or something, and that would be how presumably they would find where is this function. Um, but it, it may even be the, if what if the functions in, you know, you're grepping your source code, what if the functions in, in Boost, but it's in another library, you have using statements somewhere. Function is in another library or something, not in my code, it's a bit harder to find. Um, Yes, but that, that's also true. Like, 
once you have cross library dependencies, you have to have free functions yeah, to, in, to like to interoperate, but to like to glue different things together because they can't be members. Like yeah. that problem already exists with multi library. One of the solution. nice things about the way it's in Texas right now is that if it's a me member function in my class, I know where it would come from. Hmm. So the comment was if it's a member function in my class, I know where it comes from, and I can tell that from the call syntax. Yeah. And I believe I am out of time, um, but I will still be here for questions at the end. So thank you all for coming.